Hi, it's me again. Welcome back to my channel. Today we are going to talk about the reading vlog that has commenced for Crescent City. What is this called? House of Breath and Sky. House of Sky and Breath. I started it. I said I wasn't going to start it. And I started it. And I have thoughts. So we're going to start with the first thing that I marked and tabbed in here, which is Bryce arched a brow, grateful for the change of subject and twisted toward where she pointed. On it, a powerful fey male stood poised above an anvil. Hammer raised skyward in one fist, lightning cracking from the skies, filling the hammer and flowing down toward the object of the hammer's intended blow. A sword. Its label simply read, unknown sculptor, Palmyra, circa 125 VE. And I had a thought as I was reading that and like it was circulating in my brain. Initially I read this and I was like, we're still making the references to Norse mythology. Like we have already had Midgard and now this is very clearly like Thor and Mjolnir. Like I don't know how this could be anything other than Thor and Mjolnir. But also as I was reading it, I was like, wow, that could really be like some kind of Foreshadowing for Hunt. Does Hunt get a hammer at some point in the series? Is Hunt supposed to be like the living embodiment of Thor? He loves to play with like Greek gods and goddesses or and you know, we already did that in her other series. The dog is laying on my blanket and not not being very sharing. The blanket is not equitably distributed, dog. Yeah, she's already like used Greek and Roman mythology in some ins like instances in her other books. So like, is that why we're choosing Norse now? And is Hunt like some kind of Norse reincarnation of that? Or is this like further proving that it's actually Earth and this is Midgard? And you know, like, I don't know. Anyway, so that was my, my first, my first tab. And then the second thing that came up was it was the stupid bargain she made with Hunt that rather than diving right into bed, they'd wait until winter solstice to act on their desires. Funny enough, today is winter solstice, <laughs> like in the real world. Spend the summer and autumn getting to know each other without the burdens of a psychotic archangel and demon on the prowl. Which is just really funny because this is now the second time where I feel like, like, oh my god, I almost said Taylor Swift. Uh, pff, can you tell what's been on my mind recently? This is the second time where I feel like Sarah J. Mass has called out her own work and criticisms of her work in this series. And like, she's drawing attention to those criticisms, but I don't know if she's actually doing anything about them. I think it's more of just like a, I see you and I don't care, but I'm gonna mention it in your book or in my book. So that's like the second time where I feel like she's cheekily poked fun at herself, whether intentional or not, or like calling out the haters or like actually trying to address the problem and like be a better writer. I, I don't know which one, but that's the second time that's happened where I'm like, hmm, you read things online or somebody tells you what, what is happening online and like common criticisms of your book. We can't chew on that right now. You have to wait. Can I give you the bone back after I'm done talking? No, you have to wait. Be a good girl. The third thing that I marked was, oh, come on, Bryce hissed at the glowing scar between her breasts or what she could glimpse of it with the neckline of her t-shirt and her bra on the way. It lit up the fabric of both, and if she hadn't been facing the towering fey male who'd appeared out of a cloud of shadows, she might have used the moment to ponder why and how it glowed. Ugh, tell us it's foreshadowing without telling us it's foreshadowing, Sarah J. Mass. So clearly there is something causing her her star on her chest to glow, something in relation to this new female Cormac that just got introduced, who um, appeared in this world in a very similar fashion to Reese, at first appearing to Feyre, walking through a shadow of darkness and like, hey, what's up? This is a cousin of runes from his mom's side, so they're not actually related. So now I'm wondering, like, this is, clearly the broody black broody bad boy like the dick character that we thought rowan was we thought resan was is this the second love interest is this who like i don't want to say end game because i feel like sarah J. mass is switching up her romance you know plot beats a little bit with what she's done with hunt and 
Bryce so far, but is this our second love interest? We'll find out. I'm suspicious of him because he's an asshole. He's Faye. He clearly has a connection to her with like his star sword. Um, he has like, he's the cousin that like had the other claim uh, and went through the ordeal with Rune and like they had to fight and whatever. Um, and he obviously didn't win and Oh, oh, and they're engaged. Oh, I forgot about that part. They're betrothed. So I feel like something's going to happen there because it's obviously like a arranged marriage or something. And while I love reading about those, this one seems fishy. I'm still shocked that she and Ethel are, haven't had sex yet. That is probably the thing that I'm like most confused by. Just because this is Sarah J. Mass. And this is supposed to be adults. She sat so nicely while I talked so she can have her bone back. Yeah, you can have that back. That's not the new one that you got for Christmas, though, because you and Scotty fought over it. Because you each got one, but you thought they were both for you. Because you're the baby. And you don't share very well. I'm using a pillow to prop you up. Is this going to work? I've been reading more of this book since we last chatted. Um, I'm a good, like quite a bit further. Um, the last time we chatted, I was about 10% into the book and now I'm like over 25%. And things do be happening. Things do be happening. Don't kick me, that is rude. We find out, and I've realized I didn't even talk about like that whole first prologue of this book. Um, so this book opens in like one of the war camps on the battlefield. And we're following this character named Sophie. And she's like, I gotta hear remember now, like battling something or like in a fight or trying to escape someone. She's fighting the hind, possibly. I don't know, I don't remember. But there was a character Sophie and there was a character Pippa. Pippa maybe? And then Sophie's brother Emil. And I think Emil was missing and they were trying to find Emil. And we find out that Sophie is a Thunderbird, which is a brand new character that we've never had in any of Sarah J. Mass's works before. I don't know how I feel about the fact that she's inserting the Thunderbird because that is a very traditionally um, indigenous First Nations mythological creature. Um, and you know, just, I don't know how I feel about that, <laughs> but she's a Thunderbird. I'm kind of interested to see what we learn more about her and like what her powers are. Cause apparently the Asteri, people who control this world, hunted all the Thunderbirds to extinction like way long time ago and somehow one of them escaped and then Sophie is a byproduct of that one's like lineage. Um, so we find out she's a Thunderbird. Her brother's a Thunderbird. They have special powers. Don't know what those are yet, but they want to use them in this war. Pippa wants to use them in the rebel cause. I think Pippa is a rebel. Also find out that Sophie is murdered. Um, I can't remember the prologue if like we know that she's murdered or whatever. I can't remember what happens at the end of that, but we find out that she was dropped into the river, attached to these cement blocks, and when Therion, our merman, goes to investigate her death scene, um, she's not there and the locks are unlocked. So did she escape or did somebody steal her dead body? Somebody help her? We don't know. But Apparently she's very important because the River Queen wants her dead or alive. So I'm excited to learn more about that. And like we get into some more things with her in a moment. Um, but that was the first thing. Then we talked about like how mating works in this world, which I thought was so interesting. It is very interesting to see how Sarah J Mass like keeps commenting on her own works and on her own tropes in this book. And we're talking about how Connor, um, the dead wolf shifter thought that Bryce was his mate. Um, and that really like stings for Bryce because obviously he's dead and she didn't treat him the best to be honest. Um, but like they learned that the term mate has many different iterations of it, depending on like who you are and like what your um, species is. So they talk about like how wolves have mates and fays have mates. And they talk about how for a fay mate, a bond is deeper than marriage and beyond an individual's control. The angels she knew used the term far more lightly. For the Malachim, it was akin to marriage and matings could be arranged like breeding animals in a zoo. And then Connor 
always thought that Bryce was his mate. So these Fae still have the same kind of mating in this book, in this series. And we know Bryce is a Fae and she hasn't mated with Hunt. Hunt is an angel and they mate differently. And I don't know, I just like don't think that Hunt is her mate. I don't think he's endgame. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm like very hesitant to become attached to them because I, I, I know how she writes. And I'm very hesitant to become attached to them because I don't want to be heartbroken. It's kind of like when you're watching Game of Thrones and you know not to get attached to any of the characters because they're all going to die anyway. That's how I feel about the relationships in these books. Then we learn more about the witches. And apparently, like, I was freaking out in the last book because we find out that Hypaxia, like, leans a broom against a tree and she, like, takes off on a broom. And I thought that was, like, so special and unique and, like, obviously was a sign that she was tied to the Iron Witches of Throne of Glass. But apparently all the witches in this world ride on brooms. I just must have missed that somewhere. But we do learn that the queen, Hecuba, has two daughters from different sires. Hypaxia sire, who is the one that is betrothed to Rune, was a powerful necromancer from the House of Flame and Shadow. And Hypaxia seems to have inherited his gifts alongside her mother's. Necromancy? Witches? I don't know. That could be so cool. Oh my god. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking now. I'm thinking, like, all of these characters that died in the first book, like, could she necromancy magic them alive? Could Danica? We are led to believe that she's very much, like, dead. I don't know. Could be interesting. Could be interesting. Then we find out that her half-sister is the Hind. And the Hind is out here trying to kill Sophie, or did kill Sophie, and she seems to be, like, a terrible, um, terrible person. She didn't inherit any witch gifts. Say what she is. Is she a is she a, a, a shifter? Yeah, shape shifting. Well, her dad is a shape shifting male, a stag, and their child is the hind, who I believe is also a shape shifter. But she doesn't. I can't remember what she shape shifts into. But I don't think she has any witch gifts, according to this. Then we learn that Bryce's dad is more of a dick than we could have imagined. He says <laughs> to that Cormac was always been the son I should have had rather than the one I was burdened with. Oh my God. So he is going to take his daughter who he doesn't give two shits, a lick and a shit about, um, who has been unclaimed by him for her entire life, who is now, you know, more powerful than him. But just, 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 just a hair, but she's more powerful than him and she's going to marry him to the guy that he thinks should have always been his son. So like, to hell with my daughter, to hell with my son, I'm going to arrange something to get a more important son to me. What an ass bag. We hate that for them. Learned some more secrets about Danica too. Shocking. Um, for a character who died in the first like 100 pages of the, the series, she sure does have a lot to do with the plot and the storyline and like literally everything that's going on. Um, so she's a bloodhound, which is this special thing. I don't know. I don't know, can only shapeshifters be bloodhounds? Can only wolf shapeshifters be bloodhounds? That means that she can scent bloodlines and the secrets within bloodlines. Therefore she knew when she first met Rune after knowing Bryce that they were half siblings and not actually cousins and knew like the secrets behind Bryce and her parentage and stuff um, upon meeting them. And she never told Bryce that she knew those things. She's like becoming a very interesting character for, for being dead. We also learned so much more about like the history of this world and like the starborn prince and princess. Um, the last starborn queen was Thea. And we know that like Bryce inherited her line or her powers or whatever. Um, and that it existed as a duality and Thea was like wiped from history essentially um and that the starborn king or male counterpart is the one that everybody knows of so bryce has her light in her i recognize that luster anywhere i'm assuming you have her other gifts as well this is Adis, the the cat that's not a cat who's actually like a prince of hell um he knew the last starborn queen Adis also says i did and i knew the sniveling prince whose light you bear and pointed to rune we learned that peleus was no true prince. He was Thea's high general and appointed himself prince after he forcibly wed Helena, Thea's daughter. Helias, who's supposed to be like this, you know, wonderful historical figure, 
I love how they are playing with like rewriting history for the sake of people in charges like goals and end games because we know that that happens in real life and it's such an interesting thing to read about in a fictional world like having the powers that be rewrite history and rewrite the story to fit their narrative um, and their goals and like it's always important to think about who like when you're reading historical accounts and stuff who's writing it um because if you look at the other side of that argument those writers uh might view it very differently like the way that we learn about the american revolution in the u.s versus how i'm sure people in the uk learn about the american revolution is very different we find out then that peleus killed thea forcibly married her daughter helena and stole Thea's sword that belonged to Helena, but bestowed it on their children, the men, the male offspring who corrupted Helena's line. So it seems like this is supposed to be a female power. Um, and the men stole it. <laughs> Shocking. So your celebrated Prince Peleus, the so-called first starborn prince, was an imposter. Thea's other daughter got away, vanished into the night. I never learned of her fate. Peleus used the star sword and the horn to set himself up as a prince and passed them on to his offspring. The children Helena bore him through rape. Ho, 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 ho. Peleus is the garbage scum of a human, or I guess of a fae. So yeah, stole from her line all of these magical talents, all these magical gifts, bestowed it upon his male children, discarded any female children he had. And I'm very interested, it, it is very suspicious that they said that there was a sister of Helena that got away, vanished into the night, and we don't know anything about her. Hackle's raised for that one. We're going to keep an eye out for that because that will 100% come back around. Then they're talking more about the history of the world and like who wrote the history. We know that the Asteri wrote the history, which I like was just talking about. Um, and then they ask like, what was here before the Asteri? And Therian says, Ancient humans and their gods dwelled here. I've heard the ruins of their civilization are deep beneath the sea. So is that why there's like definitely some Norse influence because they've stolen all of that history from the ancient humans and their gods? It also seems like the Prince of Hell, who we are supposed to, Princes of Hell, are supposed to think are being like the attackers and the villains of the story. I don't really know yet who exactly is the villain of the story, but... They were painted as the villains in the first book because they're the reason that like all of the demons and stuff got into Crescent City and like called that giant, caused that giant um, like mass murder in the first book. And Ada says it was a mistake that beasts were swept in here. They were pets. They were animals. Micah, the arch angel, arch angel opened the doors to the pens and they ran amok as they saw fit. Fortunately, you took control of the situation before our intervention was required. And then they're like, well, what the fuck, dude? Like, a lot of people died. A lot of children died. And he's like, well, more are going to die. More are going to die. And if you think that was bad, if you don't take advantage of your situation as it is now and learn your powers and bond with the, or band with, with whatever, um, we're going to just lose this whole thing. And so it seems like the rebels who we've, you know, been led to believe are bad and are causing a problem because Briggs in the first book was like seen as a minor villain. We know that the humans in the north or wherever they are, Pangea, are causing a bunch of issues and we're, seen, we're supposed to believe that they are also villains. We're supposed to believe that the um, the hell princes are, are villains. And it seems like it's really the Asteri that's the problem. And then we learn that there's a rebel in our midst. Cormac is a rebel agent and he knows Sophia possibly could be in love with Sophie. Is it Sophie? Yeah, Sophie. Was there another book where she had a character named Sophie? She only agreed to marry Bryce because Danica was going to help secure Sophie and Emil in safety. And so he needed access to Bryce and to her cousin, Rune, brother Rune, um, and that's why he agreed to marry her because he wanted to be like implanted in this little circle to keep an eye on Sophie. That brings us up to where I'm currently at. I don't know. I have a lot of thoughts, but I also have like no thoughts. I feel like there's a lot of like open threads right now. A lot of like things that are happening, 
but I don't really know like which one is like the main storyline and which ones are like side quests and like who's the main villain. It seems like who the villains that we're meant to believe are villains are not actually villains and the people that we are meant to believe are like not villains are the actual villains which seems very like commentary on the real world and you know real life and stuff like that which is very interesting because Sarah J Mass doesn't normally do that. No, no, I don't know if she's doing it well. I can't tell you she's doing a good job at it, but um, there seems to be an attempt. I'm gonna try to be better about like updating as I like read these things rather than having to go back and like rehash all the things that I've learned. Cause I feel like it just makes these clips boring and makes them hard to keep track of where I'm at in the story, you know? Currently Hunt is in a dream. Well, I think he is supposed to be in a dream, but he's like in a pocket world with the seventh prince of hell, Apollyon. This is the dude that ate the seventh Asteri, devoured him whole, the star eater. Um, but Hunt is asking him why he's there. And he says, you are here because I wish to meet you to assess your progress. Progress for what? Progress of what kind? What does he mean? And then he says, both of you, meaning Hunt and Bryce, would benefit from training. Your powers are more similar than you realize. Conduits, both of you. You have no idea how valuable you and the others like you are. What does that mean? Who are the others like them? They have similar powers, so like he has his lightning powers, but there's probably more than just the lightning powers, right? And then she can, we don't really know what she can do because she hasn't explored any of it, so... I'm still very hesitant to get attached to Bryce and Hunt together because I just feel like something bad is gonna happen to Hunt. I don't know why, but I just feel like something really bad is gonna happen to him and I'm gonna be heartbroken at the end of this book. You ever look at your dog and just think, man, you are so special and you're lucky that you have a house to live in because you wouldn't survive by yourself as she is currently Smashing my pillow. You know, I didn't really like that one anyway, Brew. It's not my favorite. Did not want to keep that forever. Thank you for smashing it. I feel like in each one of these clips, I look more and more like a couch gremlin and that I am becoming one with my couch. And that's because I am. But so now we get to a part here where Bryce is like thinking about the other worlds that exist, like the other planets that exist here and like how she feels that like perhaps their gods are like pulling strings in a way and she says after the spring I can't help but wonder if there is something out there guiding all of this if there's some game afoot that's I don't know bigger than anything we can grasp such a classic Sarah J Mass thing um she loves to like have her main characters be players in a larger like game for more important people um so like she loves to use her main characters as pawns so it wouldn't surprise me if these guys are also pawns in a larger game she loves to do that and then rune asks her what do you mean and then she says hell is another world another planet ada said so months ago i mean the demons worship different gods than we do but what happens when the worlds overlap when demons come here do their gods come with them and all of us the veneer we all came from somewhere else do, we were immigrants into Midgard, but what became of our home worlds, our home guard, gods? Do they still pay attention to us? Remember us? Are they still pulling in the strings for us? And that makes me think if they are part fae, and if we're thinking that like they came to this world Midgard from somewhere else, I feel like somewhere else isn't like a leap and a bound to think that it could be like a throne of glass planet or a Court of Thorns and Roses planet because both of those worlds have Fae. And so did the gods of either of those worlds pay attention to Bryce? I'm thinking they do. There's too many, there's too many like Easter eggs inserted in here to make me, to, to like make you think that this is going to somehow tie in to her other books. I'm going to be pissed if they don't. So mad. I'm going to be so, so mad. So like, She's laying too much groundwork. It has to happen. Okay, who is Agent Daybright? Because it's clearly somebody that either we've met before or we've heard them talk about before or someone important because Rune is convinced that he knows her 
and recognizes her voice and her smell and like they are in a mind connection right now and she's like there's no way you can smell me like you don't know me and he's like how do you know I don't know you if I've never met you and you don't know who I am and I don't know she's also like a fire sprite or like always cloaked in fire I feel like we know her I also don't think I've ever looked so cute in my entire life. Oh my god. Okay, so there's like a lot of things happening. So Rune gets um, abducted by Reapers and taken into the sewers and Bryce goes after him. And when he gets abducted, that's when I was just saying um, the voice of the woman was in his head and he thinks he knows her. But then Cormac appears, who apparently can teleport. Winnowing. Just saying. Bryce picks up the, the star sword. And this is the first time that she's ever used it because she keeps like pushing it onto Rune. Like it's yours, it's yours, it's yours. And she doesn't want it. Um, but she picks up the star sword for the first time. And we had just finished saying that the Reapers are unkillable. They can just be like removed, but they can't actually die because they're grim Reapers. Um, and then she slays them with the star sword. She kills the unkillable with her sword. And it's like glowing and, and, and like gleaming and all these things that it never does for Rune and it's just like singing this magical song and it's glowing in Rune's in, in Bryce's hands. Something it never does for Rune. And she kills a reaper. I think that Emil is possibly hiding in the bone quarter, which I feel like we've known that for a while or at least assumed that for a while. And the Prince of the Pit, Apollyon, wants to either use Emil or it's going to be his next greatest challenger, a worthy opponent. So he's either going to join that cause or he's going to become the adversary to the bone or to, to the, the prince of the pit, who also wants to fight Bryce at her most powerful because his previous opponent, Peleus, just wasn't sufficient. So many things are going on. Just wanted to throw this out there. They have mentioned that there are seven planets and seven Asteri, these star people, several times now. But they've also mentioned that there's only technically six now because the Prince of the Pit is a star eater and ate one of them. Is that really what happened? Is that really what happened? Because they've been harping on there are seven, but technically only six now quite a few times. So like... It's enough to make me suspicious. Some more developments. So, Rune gets kidnapped by some Reapers and dragged into the sewers. And they assume that the Reapers are those of the Underking in the Bone Quarter. And they go to confront him about it. And he says, what makes you think they're mine? So, I know that like each city in this world has like its own death quarter or like bone quarter or whatever so where are these reapers from what city who was trying to steal rune then we also find out that lesser or lower spirits like lahaba um who is the fire spirit sprite fire sprite don't go to the under king because they're of no use to him so what is he using we find out that like he feasts on souls and stuff. So like that the only reason that people get sent there is that he can feast on souls. Like has a nibble. He says, I take one or two nibbles from those who have extra to give. I don't know. And then we also learned who Danica's father is. And he's a dread wolf, which is a demon in wolf's clothing, essentially. Um, and yeah, her dad is like the Heinz second in command it explains all of her like weird powers and stuff so we find out from rune that the bond between athelar and uh bryce is that of like a fey bond um they're in danger in a battle and he's like full-on freaking out that she's in danger and like covered in lightning and stuff and it was the same way that he was when he killed sandriel and Rune's explaining that this is exactly how fey bonds are. So you guys are like clearly mates and that's why you smell different because you are clearly like mated and your scents are intertwining. Um, and Bryce has the comment of like, but he's an angel. So like, is he an angel? 
Is there more to that? Do we know who his dad is? What's the history there? Is he actually an angel? Now I'm curious. And I'm also thinking that like something really, really bad is gonna happen to Hunt at the end of this book. I just met a dragon. Excuse me, which is pretty cool. <laughs> Get out of here. I really did think when the demon ripped Ethan's throat out that he was dead. That was it. He was dead. He was a goner. I was convinced. I gasped out loud. I didn't know what to think or feel, but I think he might be okay. Because I'm a little bit beyond that, and I think he's healing. And I think he saw a med witch. So I think we might be fine. Also, do you guys like how I still have my Christmas tree up? I took everything else down. And that's been there for like a week now. I need to finish putting that away. Um, I have some cozy, you know, what is this? Ambiance? sound and such on um but it just really like makes it cozy in here to keep the christmas lights up so i haven't taken them down yet i cannot believe that bryce showed up to this like a siri ball archangel ball whatever it is and announced to everyone that she was like mated with hunt and that hunt is a prince in front of everybody in front of her dad, in front of all of like the important people. What a way to piss everyone off. Celestina and Hypaxia caught in the coat closet? That is not who I expected either of them to be like lusting after <laughs> for the like 800 pages of this book. Damn, and Hunt and Bryce just like busted into their coat closet session. So I think we have found out some very crucially important information. So Bryce is like meeting with the Prince of the Pit, I think. Oh, what's his name? Apollyon? Yeah. In like a dream world, dreamscape type of thing. And you do not trust us. Good. Thea did. It was her downfall. The Starborn Queen? Yes. Aedas is great love. His what? which is exactly what Bryce's reaction was, and mine, Aedas's great love was Thea? And then to follow that up, Bryce says, I'm sorry, but please back up. You summoned me into this dream to tell me about how Aedas, Prince of the Chasm, was the lover of Thea, the first starborn queen, even though they were enemies? And then he says, they were not enemies. We were her allies. She and some of the Fae forces allied with us against the Asteri. So are the, the Asteri the true big bads and not the like princes of hell? And the fact that one of them ate the Asteri, you know, as a star eater is like not much, not as much of like a bad thing necessarily. I don't know. I'm curious. I can't wait to find out more. I'm sure as I read the rest of this page, I will learn more and we'll be back here shortly. Come find me in hell when you learn the truth. I'm so hooked. I need to know. I'm so hooked. <gasps> Apparently the reapers that were sent after Bryce and Rune were from the Eternal City, which is across oceans. And reapers can cross, well at one point crossed realms. Um, so they're like, why would water stop them? So that's very interesting. And also the Erd King knows Jessiba, but not by that name. Who is she? Who do we think Jessica is? I think she's Thea. Wouldn't that be wild? What is going on? Baxian was Danica's mate? What? He has a tattoo of her handwriting on him? That's why he's helping them this whole time? Brewie, are you cold? Yeah, your little jacket on? Is it like negative 36 outside with the wind chill? Negative 11 without the wind chill? Yeah, is it too cold for your little paws? Oh my goodness. One also has her jacket on. They seem to like them, so we haven't taken them off yet. Something very sad happened today. My library book got taken back by the library, so we're switching to the hardcover book, which is 
it's so heavy and so thick. It's 801 pages. Um, luckily, I did find my spot and I didn't have to like spoil myself trying to figure out where I was. I'm on chapter 69 and um, what is like the big thing that's happened that I need to tell you? I, I bookmarked everything in the like e-version from the library. I don't remember what the last thing was that I bookmarked. Oh, Danica has a mate. Did we talk about this already? Shocked me. I have to say, Bryce is getting a little sick of like every other page, learning something new about Danica, not realizing that she didn't really know Danica. Um, I am also getting kind of tired of every other page. There being a new secret about Danica. Um, because she seems to be like a compulsive liar. <laughs> Just in like the fact that she never told anybody anything about her and like nobody knows who she is, but she has like this best friend that she loves so much. And it's just giving like shitty friend vibes at this point. Like there were some choices that she made that were, you know, beneficial to Bryce or like for her own protection or whatever. And some of it just feels like shitty friendship. Um, that's kind of how I feel about the fact that no one knew she had a mate, even though the mate's supposed to be like, you know, controversial because he's a member of the Triari or like, uh, is he an angel? He's a shifter. I don't know. Anyway, it's like a big deal. Um, so that I think is the last big thing to have happened. Therian defected from the river court and is now employed by the Viper Queen, which seems like a choice. Um, and not a good one, one that will have some repercussions. Um, I'm still waiting to find out what the connection is going to be to any of her other books because I feel like there's going to be one. Um, I'm also waiting to be devastated because my friend said this book's going to break my heart by the end. So I'm waiting to be devastated. I am waiting for the connection to Akatar or Throne of Glass. Um, and I'm sick of Danica. I'm, I'm so over her. At some point, I think it was one of the princes of hell mentioned that the Asteria were bad, and that they weren't this like benevolent, otherworldly godly force. Um, and I see what they mean now. And I'm starting to think that the Asteria are the actual villains of the story. I kind of wondered for a while, like who are the villains? Who are we fighting? Who are we taking down? Because the princes of hell just, I don't know. It didn't seem intriguing. It didn't seem interesting. So now I'm thinking it's the print, it's the Asteri. And we just learned that they essentially are stealing everybody's power, their first light, their second light, to power themselves. Like they feed on it. It's like almost parasitic in a way. Um, in like the, in the traditional sense that you would be like sacrificing something to Prince of Hell, like they're almost like the Princes of Hell, not the actual Princes of Hell. This is wondering like, do they actually have stars? Are they actually like these holy creatures with like these special stars in their bodies or are they just succubus, like feeding off of the city? And I think it's that. I think that they're just succubus and they're just feeding off the city. It seems to be like the big secret that Danica might have been working towards which seems significant, but also not as significant as I thought it was going to be. Like, I'm a little let down that that is all that we found in the secret special room. Are the Asteria like planet eaters? What is that Marvel movie with like the planet eaters where they like, isn't it a Marvel movie where they just go around killing planets to feed them or like killing sons to feed them. Isn't that something that happens in a Marvel movie? Am I making that up? That's what this feels like. This is the reveal I wanted. This is so much better than just the Asteri feed on first light. Um, this is so much better. So it says, deal world located, indigenous life not sustainable, but conditions prime for colonization. Have contacted others to share bounties. So I'm guessing that means they contacted other Asteri or whatever like they actually are to share people from their world. And then they opened the rifts and invited them through the rifts into Midgard. Wild, wild. And then it says, um, for the Fae, they did not see the old enemy who offered a hand through space and time like a fish to bait. They came and they opened the gates to us willingly. They walked through them to Midgard at our invitation, leaving behind the world they knew. There's quite a lot happening in this book. 
<laughs> We've learned that obviously we know Thea fell in love with Adis, um, one of the princes of hell. And we also know that the princes of hell aren't actually bad guys, that they figured out the Asteri's plan on their world like so much sooner than anybody else and they chased them off of their world, hell. And then they started chasing them through all of the cosmos, following them as they were, you know, trying to take over other planets, getting rid of them, getting rid of them. And then they worked with Thea to close all of the rifts in Midgard, um, which trapped the Asteri in Midgard and they're unable to leave anymore. And now they want to use Bryce's power to open all of the gates again, the rifts, um, so they can continue traveling. And they talked about the Fae and how like the Fae are different. Like they're all Fae, but they're like different kinds of Fae. So I also really hilariously love that Bryce said, look, I already did this whole villain monologuing thing with Micah this spring. So cut to the chase to Regulus because girlfriend, same. Watched my vlog for the first book, you know how much I hate villain monologuing. Um, so that was a little funny that that was in here. Danica realized that the shifters are Fae. Not your kind of fay, Bryce's. Your breed dwelled in a lovely verdant land rich with magic. If it's of any interest to you, your starborn bloodline specifically hailed from a small isle a few miles from the mainland. And while the mainland had all manners of climes, the isle existed in beautiful near permanent twilight. But only a select few of the entirety of your world could shift into their humanoid forms to animal ones. The Midgard shifters were fay from a different planet. All the fay in that world shared their form with an animal. The mare descended from them too. Perhaps they once shared a world where your breed of fay, but they had been alone on their planet for long enough to develop their own gifts. And Bryce is like, but none of the shifters have pointed ears. And he says, oh, we bred that out of them. It's, it was gone within a few generations. So these fay, or some versions of these fay, um, now that we've learned that like the shifters and the fae are all fae. I wonder if any of them are from any of our other favorite fae planets. Descendants from our favorite fae planets. Try to say favorite fae planets five times fast. You're annoying. Stop crying. I'm so close to the end. I have like 40 pages left. <gasps> Did Cormac just die? Consumed by his ball of fire? I can't really figure out why she's crying, except that maybe she wants me to come over there and sit with her. Cause she's not at the door. She's on the couch. So she wants me to come sit with her on the couch, I think. I moved to the couch to see if it would get the dog to stop crying. And what do you know? She's now happily chewing on a bone. No more crying. Love that for me. Um, but anyway, what is going on? The hind is agent day, day bright, daylight, daybreak, whatever. The hind is day? I honestly like can't keep all of the H people like straight. The hellhound, the harpy, the hind, um, the hammer. Like I can't keep all of them straight, but the hind is the sister of Hypaxia. So Hunt has a new tattoo, thorn. Slave marking upon his brow. How sad. So they keep saying this is a demon, but it is a, a, a man-like creature with black leathery wings. It's not a demon, is it? Is it? It's not a demon. What is going on? <laughs> what is happening? I can't. Oh my God. I think I might actually start crying. <laughs> Just with Cassian. And Rune, not Rune, Rissand, and Azriel, and Armin. Armin, why can't I remember any of their names? It's been so long since I've read those books, like literally so long that I cannot remember all the like little details. And oh my God, one of them has, has the twin to the star sword that we learned about earlier in the book when they mentioned there's a dagger that matches it, but no one has seen it forever. It's the dagger that they use in a court of the, ser the, the, the court series? Rice recognizes her and like thinks she looks familiar and she's the only one that's like clocking Bryce. 
And then Bryce speaks in Old Fae, the ancient language of the Fae. My mind is just blown a little bit. No, 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 I, no, no. Rune does not look like Reese. No. I've had the hardest time picturing Rune. Oh my God. I can't. Oh my God. What is happening? Why is this so close to my face? I knew that there was gonna be a tie-in. Did I think it was gonna be with the main fucking characters? No. You know what I'm wondering though now as I'm sitting here staring off into thought? A long time ago, Sarah J. Mass, I have the epilogue still to go, so like we're not done yet. But a long time ago, Sarah J. Mass signed a book deal for three additional books in the A Court of Thorns and Roses series. There are literally tears coming out of my eyes. Um, we got the, obviously the first trilogy, then we got the, Nessie, the Nesta and Cassian book. And like, I hadn't heard any news. Like, granted, I'm not in the book like loop the way I used to be, but I haven't heard any news of any additional books coming out. And it's been, I think this will be three years since um, Silver Flames came out. So I, like, I, I felt like it'd been a long time. And now I'm wondering if, like, this is those additional books in that series. You know? Like, did she rework it? Or, like, have this new idea or something to where it, it, it like, became a whole other series and isn't a spinoff necessarily of Akatar anymore? I need to read the epilogue. I am so, so glad that I read this literally a week before the final installment comes out because I don't... Is it the final installment? I don't even know. That's, that, that's a bold claim. It could not be. I don't really know that much. I think it's the last book announced, though, for that this series. But I'm so glad. I only have to wait a week. Because if I had to wait like a full year or however long it's been since this came out, I, I, might, I might not have survived. Just saying. I was thinking about this. We also learn at the end of the book that it was like not Adis. Any time that we thought she was speaking with Adis, I don't know if she summoned Adis in the first book, but like in this book, when we think that Adis appeared to her in her apartment as the cat, uh, wasn't actually Adis. It was Regulus and he bypassed her wards, strutted right in and nobody noticed or recognized anything. And he was like manipulating the whole situation and manipulating what they were looking for and like their plans and what information they were supposed to find. So he seems like a scumbag, not a fan of him, but Apollyon was an actual like Prince of Hell that they were communicating with. So very interesting. And it kind of like colors your whole idea of the story that Adis tells you about the princess Thea and her lover or the dude, I don't know, whatever the dude's name was, we don't care about him, and her two daughters and how they were trying to close the rifts um, because she fell in love with Adis and they were helping her. And then she got the stupid Siri stuck in this world forever. <sighs> Mind blown. You know, I just realized. Why are you crying again? So when they sent Bryce on this journey to like learn her powers, um, cause you know, Adis, not Adis, but Regulus disguised as Adis as a cat, wanted her to learn her powers so that they could, you know, abduct her and force her to use her powers to open all of the rifts. They tricked her into learning about her powers. They're the worst.